reality has a few laws. Namely, your humidor always is too small, you never are rich enough, and your 3D printer never is big enough. And I recently had to produce an analogon of an object for an injection molding process, and my printer was too small. And so I broke it up into four pieces, which I then glued together. And there is a very, very efficient way to do this in OpenSCAD, which I call marching the cube. And so in this video, we are going to use OpenSCAD and we are going to march the cube to break down a large model into four little pieces, which a 3D printer can process easily. So what do we have here? We have the object which we need and which we want to print. But sadly, this object is a bit too large for my printer. And now for the reasons of fun and stupidity, I am going to introduce a cube which I'm marking like this. And you see here, we've got this cube. Let's assume this cube is my printable area. And so now I can march this cube across from here to here, to here to here, in order to finally end up with a workable result. And you see here, marching it is basically pretty simple. You see now I put 65, 65 here, now the cube is here, and so on and so on. But now the question comes, how do I put these two objects together? And to answer this, we have to take a little detour into OpenSCAD. And now that we've got the printable area and the whole cube in line, it's time to start using an operator. Essentially, one way I like to think of an operator is like such a logic gate, which has two inputs and one output. And what is very important is the inputs, they are sensitive to the sequence. So first is the object which comes first in the invocation of the object. And second is the second object in the invocation of the operator. As you see here in an example, you see A and B. And now if we consult the OpenSCAD documentation a bit further, we see there are a total of three operators. Number one is difference. Difference only gives us a one if a point is set in A and is clear in B. In all other cases, it gives us zero, so we can't use it. Candidate number two is union. Union gives us a one if the point is set either in A or in B. So we also obviously can't use that. And finally, we get intersection. Intersection gives us a one only if both A and B set the relevant point. And this obviously is exactly what we need because now only if the printable area and the object model both declare a point as relevant, it will be relevant in the final output. I know you don't want to see this. I don't want to do it either. Like, subscribe, please. And yes, if you want to really make me happy, buy my book. There is a link in the show notes. It's available in English. It also is available in German. And so thank you very much. And as you see, this is the working code. I'm using an intersection operator. And then we've got this guy here, the cube, and we've got the rest of the object. And now I can make the first part. I can make the second part. I can make the third part and I can make the fourth part. Basically, it's pretty simple. You just adjust these coordinates, zero, zero, x, zero, zero, x, x, x. You always render and you save as an STL file. And then you end up with four STL files, which you can feed to your printer. And basically it's done. And now that we've got the parts ready to go, 
I still quickly wanted to show you the actual assembly process. And for this, normally I would use the Proxon IBS, but because this is currently in use with one of my friends, I'm gonna use my big angle grinder. And you see here, this tool, I've attached it to the back of the cable with a cable tie. And our first step is to get off the cutting disc. It's a bit tough on those Bosch units. You see, you need to get this to register, and then you can take it off. And what I've got here, it's a backing pad from a local Hungarian company called Festa. And you see, it's essentially like a Brillo with sandpaper on it. This is relatively rough, but I don't have any other in the lab at the moment. And then you simply drill this carefully onto the thing. And again, because you want to be sure, this. And so, now this will rotate, it will make hell of a din, but we can use it to sand off the sides of the object a little bit. You might wonder why I want to sand off the sides, but on most FDM printers, there is a bit of a ridge here at the bottom, at the adhesion area. And so the idea is to just give it a quick little lick and to take this off to make a little groove. I mean, you can also do it by hand and I am going to do smooth it up by hand anyways, but doing it like this, is just a faster way to get to the goal. So, and now we are out here where the dirty and the big machines live. And now you see it's just going to be the angle grinder. Just gonna grab it. And just give it a quick lick, you see here. And you just give it chuck chuck a short little bit of time. It doesn't need to be much. It's just to remove the grooves from the printing process. And the fourth and final one. And now we just go here and we give it with the fine one we give it a quick lick as to make it smooth. And then it's about like this. This is more than smooth enough for our needs. So process all the four parts. And then I'm going to see you again in the lab. You might now wonder yourself why I'm somewhat careful and why I just don't really take off a lot here. And the answer for this is this. You see here the inner structure of a throwaway piece, which I cut up. You see, we've got a thick shell on the outside and on the inside, there is just air. So you should be careful when you are removing here that you stay in the shell area. And this incidentally also is why it's a good idea to plan any holes using the open S-cut system and not just to drill. Because if you plan the hole 
you get a shell in the position of the hole. Whereas if you just punch through with a drill press, usually you just get the top and the bottom of the shell. And be that as it may, it's now time to put these together. For this, normally a gale-based glue is better, but currently I have the liquid one open, so I'm going to use the liquid instead. And essentially you check whether you can still open it. Here you see it's already half damaged, so I have to open it like this. And then you just put some glue here, rub it a little bit, and then you put it together. And you need to push it together for a little while. Essentially this is important. You see I'm using a flat surface and I'm just pushing it together like this and holding it together until the glue cures. This can take about 30 seconds. So it's about 30 seconds and with the finger you can always push it a little bit until it's almost perfect. And of course, if you're doing this productively, you could use something flat to push it against. But this is now just for a quick experiment. And then it's basically like a jigsaw puzzle. You just put them together one by one. Here you can of course already use the fourth part for spacing as well. I mean, you can be creative. This is not rocket science. The only thing which counts is that the analog on in the end is put together. And then for the fourth and final one, of course, we have to glue both sides and we can push it in a little bit. You see, the glue didn't cure yet, so <laughs> it's the pleasures of working with this kind of stuff. And then something which I like to do is I like to pour a little bit of the glue into the seams like this. See, pour some glue into the seam and push it together a little bit. This, I believe it increases robustness. Maybe it's voodoo, but I've done it a lot. If I don't use any interlocking structures and I pour in some glue, and usually, I mean, it costs nothing because you have to throw the glue away when it's opened anyways. So why not maybe do some voodoo? But as said, I so far, I believe that it does help a little bit. And then you just waddle it around your desk because you don't want it to glue itself to your desk. And watch your fingers, of course. And then when you are done, we have the analog on ready for testing. You see here, it's ready for doing a form test. And yes, if this would have to be any loads, I would of course be planning for a screw or an interlocking element or something like this. But here, as said, we don't need it. And so we are done. This is the first revision of the object. And you see here, I've got this. And now I can see if it fits. And I see this one doesn't fit. And now I can analyze why it doesn't fit and adjust it. And incidentally, this little attempt has just saved me about $150. Because this is actually going to be injection molded out of glass. And even so, my company, which I really cannot recommend enough, does a great job helping me. First of all, they still have costs. And secondarily, eventually, things just do get expensive. And so I hope that you've enjoyed this and see you around soon. Thank you very much.